we flew in so fast that I didn't even have time to call the area clear to land the helicopter. All right, Humberto, thanks for being here, sir. Um, let's just start off, why don't you just uh, introduce yourself to tell us your name, um, branch of service, uh, years you served, and then the rank you got out as. My name is uh, Humberto Nevarez Valentin. I uh, was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Came to the States at a very young age, before my first birthday. My, my father served in the military, so we moved around a bit. Uh, I, uh, what branch of service you served? Oh, United States Army. Okay, what years? I went from November of 1988 through April of uh, 2009, served 20 and a half years. Wow, and uh, what rank did you get out at? I got out as a staff sergeant. Awesome, thank yeah. you for your service. Um, yeah, uh, so continue. Talk to me a little bit more about your uh, where you were born and where you're from and your upbringing. Well, <clears throat> like I said, I was born in Puerto Rico. Um, uh, I would have been born in Germany, but my dad decided he'd go to Germany by himself. My mom wanted to go back to Puerto Rico, so I was born in Puerto Rico. I was in New York City before my first birthday, and we moved around until, I'm going to say, 1960 or 61, we went to Fort Hood. From there, my dad got stationed to Fort Jackson in 1963. Um, lived there for a few years. He went to Vietnam. We went to New York City. We came back to Fort Jackson, and there was a lot of moving between Fort Jackson and New York City. And I finished high school in, in Fort Buchanan, Puerto Rico. And oh, so we, yeah? Yes, and wow. then we, we decided... My dad came back from a tour in Korea, and we moved back to South Carolina. I was 18, and uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to join the military back then, but having a strict dad growing up, um, I'm like, I would neglect, and I'm like, I'm not going to join the military. The heck with it. Um, got married when I was 26. Did you have any uh, siblings? I had um, three brothers and a sister. Mm. Wow. Where'd you fall in line at, as age-wise? I'm the second youngest. Okay. Wow. My oldest brother, he he actually dropped out of high school and joined the military back in the 70s when mm. he was 17. He had gotten his high school diploma during his uh, first tour in the military. And from there, he got out, went to college, and then he went back in. He went through OCS. He did uh, 25 years mm. total. Uh, my other older brother, he never joined. And then my youngest brother, he did ROTC, and he did uh, 23 years. Wow. So my oldest brother, he retired as a major, and my younger brother retired as a lieutenant colonel. So we do have a uh, military <laughs> family. My dad did 30 years. Military runs in your family. Yes, yeah. it does. And now uh, my youngest brother, uh, oldest daughter, she's in the reserves. She did OTC also and did her four-year commitment, and wow. now she's in the reserves up in Fort Hamilton, New York. Okay. So, I mean, I, I know that, you know, your military runs in your family, um, but I'm just curious, is, are, they, are they who what inspired you to join, or do you have any other reasons why you joined the military? Well, my first ex-wife, I always talked to her about, maybe I should join, maybe I should join, and she finally said, you know what, maybe you should go. Because he always talked about it. And um, I was 30 years old. Oh, wow. So I joined when I was 30 years old. Went to basic at Fort Dix, New Jersey. So did you go into the recruiting office knowing what you wanted to do? Did you get a uh, No, I did not know what I wanted to do. And while I was there, um, of course, they always give you, show you the 11B portion of the um, infantry with mm -hmm. these bonuses. Mm-hmm. And uh, my plan was just to join two years, see how it went. But uh, when the recruiter came out with uh, 67 Tango, which is a Black Hawk mechanic, he told us about, hey, you can even get to ride on them. I'm like, that's a good idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but that was a five year commitment. And we agreed on it. I joined uh, to become a Black Hawk mechanic and went after basic, went to Fort Eustis. Virginia. Okay, what was that like? Um, 
is pretty, it was great. You know, I enjoyed learning the, the helicopter, being able to climb up there, learn the different components, uh, work on them and all that. Uh, we went, our classes was uh, based with students and prior service people that were changing their MOS. So we had a mix of people in there. We had two guys from Saudi Arabia mm. learning the Black Hawk helicopter. Oh, Got wow. to meet them and uh, met some good people yeah. there. How long was that school? Uh, 13 weeks. 13 weeks. Wow. Yes. Almost as like, that's like boot camp almost. Yes. Uh, um, w w was it ran like a, a boot camp environment or more of a training and learning environment? Training and learning environment. Okay. It, it was it was a relaxed kind mm. of deal. Okay. I mean, we didn't have to, uh, we still had to make midnight call, which is a lot better than nine o'clock go to bed. Yeah. yeah. I imagine you probably got tested a lot throughout that 13 weeks, huh? Did you have to take any tests? Uh, uh, any, any like, you know, to make, you know, to test your skills on the Black Hawk? Yes, we had the periodic test. Yeah. Okay. So you got through that. Um, what was your first duty station? Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Mm. <laughs> Talk to me about that. And uh, that was my, well, me and uh, one other guy that was in basic training with me. We went to basic AIT and ended up in the first unit. And uh, his name is Robert Nebo, and he's uh, living up in Clarksville, Tennessee. And uh, we stay still in touch. Yeah. So he, we became very close friends. Mm. But uh, AIT was from there, Fort Campbell. We got there, and because me and Robert Nebo, we got there, Z4s. We got ranked because we had college. Mm. So we made rank quick. We got there and uh, we were having a hard time first with the first guys we were working with. A couple of PFCs and we're trying to learn and they're trying, you know, you ask them a question, well, go see what the book says, you know, I'm like, damn, I hate that. <laughs> but uh, when we find out what well, the real reason why they were so antsy with us, it was because some NCO told them that, hey, we got rank on them, so we'll probably get flight status before they would. And we told them, hey, we're not here to get flight stuff. We're here first to learn how to work on that helicopter before we go become crew chiefs. Mm -hmm. But uh, working there, I uh, we ended up getting a corporal from flights. He decided he wanted to come back to maintenance. He kind of helped me a lot. He he said, hey, man, you know, we all make mistakes. Just get out there and work on the helicopter and, and keep learning. And it got to a point where they actually put me in charge of one of the phase teams. That's when the helicopter comes in after 500 flight hours and we strip the helicopter apart. They put me in charge and they actually sent me to the promotion board. Hmm. Uh, I was on orders for Panama. But uh, we had um, that storm come up. We got alerted for, for the storm, we went there. Did you get promoted? I did. I, I made it first cut off. So you got, what is that, E5 now? I, yes, I made E5 while I was in the desert. Okay. At two years. And then the Army, that's a, is that a sergeant? Yes. Or, okay. That's sergeant. All right. Um, we were in the desert. We ended up um, in some airport that they were building. And we staged from there. And uh, that's my first uh, experience was combat and the Gulf War, huh? In the 90s. What, yes, what, Gulf War. What was it like going over there? I liked it that I went with people I knew. You know, it was, when you go, I was a medevac unit too. So that was an experience. You know, I, while I was there, they went ahead and put me on flight status. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see much uh, gore or not because pilot I was with, he was our XO and the commander wanted him more stay in the rear, mm. not so much up in the front. Okay. But uh, it was good. My uh, younger brother, who was a lieutenant at the time, found where I was at. He came and visited me a couple of times. Huh. In Iraq? In Iraq, yes. Oh, wow. While we, were, while we were still in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Before the war started. So yeah. He came and saw me twice and I actually went with him for little R&R &R while we were there. Nice, 
Nice. That's cool. Yes. Um, what brother? What, what unit was he with while you were out there? He was with the 24th Infantry. I don't know exactly what unit, but he was MI. Okay. And that's when 24th Inf Infantry was stationed out of uh, Fort Stewart. Mm. So he was here at Fort Stewart, and I was at Fort Campbell. Okay. So how long did you stay out there for the Gulf War? I was there seven months. Seven months? Seven months. Wow. Um, just complete, just flying around with the XO, you said, right, most of the time? Yeah, we did take a few patients, but they were on. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. On little small accidents that we had around the compound. So, so after seven months, you where, where'd you come back to? You Fort Campbell. Fort Campbell. I stayed on flight status, and we had some. Uh, that's when I started, you know, flying and picking up patients. We did a lot of uh, hospital transfers mm -hmm. from Fort Campbell down to Nashville. Mm. I had a uh, my two live. Real world uh, issues was we picked up a guy from spe uh, special forces accidental shooting. That was a uh, one experience that I I'll never forget. Talk and, to me about that. And well, yeah. I was on duty first up, uh -huh. and uh, the RTO comes to tell the pilot, "Hey, I think we got a gunshot." When and the pilot goes, "Go in there and tell them, find out for sure." Well, come find out, it is an actual shooting. They were out in the back 40 training, and uh, we got the call, so we went. As soon as we got airborne, uh, we got clearance to, to go direct instead of the regular route. We went direct to the range, and they closed the ranges down, and they, we went and picked up this guy. Uh, they put him on board, and uh, just the look on, you know, the guy, had his eyes open, but the medic tried, you know, started working on him, and we took off. When we had our standardization instructor pilot, he's the one who does all the training on the pilots and all that. We flew in so fast that I didn't even have time to call the area clear to land the helicopter. He just went in there and landed so quick. I'm like, <laughs> wow. And they took the guy in and come find out he didn't make it, which mm -hmm. was... Uh, Kind of, you know, traumatizing, but you you learn to deal with it and all that. Yeah. And uh, my second uh, gunshot uh, was none other than Lieutenant uh, General Petraeus. At the time, I didn't know he, who it was, but later on, I found out it was him that got shot. It was a training. Uh, again, they were out in the back 40 training. We got a call for a gunshot. We went out there and uh, found out that officer got uh, shot so we pick him up to put him on their aircraft and uh, I saw the medic I saw the penetration right in here and when he picked him up he had like two exit wounds in the back of his shoulder and we took him down to uh, first our hospital on, on Fort Campbell from there we waited they said wait we want you to take him to uh, Nashville from there, once they stabilized him and everything, he had a collapsed lung. They stabilized him, put him on board, and uh, we transferred him down to Nashville. From there, they took him over. Wow. Um, do you have any, you know, I understand that was your job, but, you know, when you go through that, does anybody uh, check on you after that? Counselors or anything, you know? Uh, you know, no, not that time. No. Not that time. Um, the only time they actually talked to us was during uh, the only time we had, they, they asked us a question was in 2003 in the Gulf, uh, I mean the Reich War yeah. when we were there. We had a helicopter go down and it was one of our, one of our guys in, in the company was on that helicopter and he passed away mm. and all that. And they did Get, get us in the group with, with someone to talk to. And, and I told them, hey, the, that was the first time I ever told myself I'm never going to fly again. But I did. I, I continued to, uh, I wasn't a crew chief at that time. I was a technical inspector, but we, we do have, we do get on flight status. Mm -hmm. And every so often the crew chiefs, they would ask for one of our guys to go fly with them. 
so they can give their crew chief some rest. Yeah. <clears throat> how does it? Uh, how did it affect you? Um, you know, seeing seeing those traumatic events. You know, while doing your job, did you notice anything? Anything change about you afterwards? Or I'm not really sure, but I try to just deal with the best I can. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. I've never really talked to nobody about it. Anybody about it later on? No, never. You no. never. Have you ever? Uh, uh, have you ever tried to? Uh, you know, not even the VA or anybody. No, I haven't. Um, so what do you do to? to uh, I, I don't know. Do you ever? You know, do you feel anxious or? You know, do you? Do you feel like you deal with any type of PTSD for? You know, seeing th things like that. I'm not sure. Like I said, I know I haven't talked to anybody so yeah. about it, but uh, you know, I, I, that night still comes in my mind a lot because that night that uh, we lost our, our guy in our company, he, uh, I was on radio watch. Mm -hmm. uh, I was with a PFC and uh, we were watching some movies, VHS, DVDs, and uh, a call came over the the, the radio saying uh, aircraft down, and I looked at the PFC. I said, "Did they say aircraft down?" He goes, "I don't know." So we waited another 15 minutes and another call came in. We have aircraft down from 4th Battalion and 9th Battalion. And I'm like, oh, shoot, that's us. So I got on our little walkies and called our commander. And he came over and then um, he had to go identify the body. And it was our guy. So. And that night he just told everybody what happened. And actually, my platoon sergeant. I think he took it the hardest, and I went to him. I said, man, if you feel like talking later, man, I, I'm here to, to listen. Yeah. Um, so you say you, 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 you think about that. You know, it, it, how often does that come up? Like, it just comes up in the blue. It, it'll come up mainly in November. Yeah. Because it happened in, in oh, November. Really? Okay. Yeah. Wow, well, I, I see post, postings on on Facebook, mm. remembering the the guy that passed away, plus everybody that was in that unit. Mm. So certain things will trigger the, the, the yeah. event back in your in your mind, huh? Um, wow. Uh, so you, you said you were part of the invasion of Iraq and as well, right? You were out there in two thousand three. No, I was I was not part of the invasion. Oh, I had just just gotten back from Germany. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, because let me see, I went after my medevac unit, I ended up getting ordered for Korea. Okay. And I got divorced prior, prior to that to go into Korea. I was there for a year. That's kind of hard at first. That's my first night at the unit that left me there. They took me to a room, I left, and that was the first time in my military career I ever felt lonely like I didn't where was I what am I doing here I've never felt that loneliness like I did that that one night there mm. even though I went there with people I didn't know to Korea they put you in the you know in the reception area but you quickly make friends and all that but that night for some reason it was just the loneliest night I ever felt and you have just gotten a divorce yes right <laughs> at this point how long have you been in the army five years Five years? Mm. No, six. Six? Yes. Yeah. You think that, 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 is that maybe what made you feel alone? The, the divorce and... Uh... What about the divorce? It could have been of everything, you know. I didn't know anyone there yet. And uh, just being put in a room, taken and said, we'll see you in the morning. And I'm like, what am I doing? Mm. That was the worst feeling I ever had. Yeah. But after that, we made friends. I made friends and all that. And uh, I think the good thing about Korea was we had one guy there that's been in my in my office and been to Korea like twice before. So he knew places to go. So he would take us around and and we got to see things in Korea that most people don't. You know. And then what kind I, of things did you get to see? Well, I think we went. He showed us how to get downtown, to ride the subways and all that. Yeah. And none of us knew Korean. Yeah, right. Uh, just getting out and not being around military installation mm -hmm. to 
for that, you know. Yeah. How long did you do, uh, how long did you stay in Korea for? One year. One year? Yes. And then after Korea, you go back to? Fort Campbell. Or Got there, uh, met my second wife, and uh, she was in the military. The Army, too? Yes. Oh, wow. I actually met her in my old unit. I went to go see some friends, and she was there. Mm. And it wasn't long. We we got married. When you're, um, I'm curious, so if you both are in the in the military service, or mm-hmm. both, in your case, both of you get, both of you are army. Um, uh, do they put all the couples in the same duty station, or how um, does it work? It's not guaranteed. Mm-hmm. It says they guarantee fifty miles. Fifty miles. Fifty miles. Oh, so you'll at least be within fifty miles. Of Supposedly, each other? yes. Okay. But we just happened to be on the same concern in, in Germany. Mm. Um, and we were there for three years. I was in the medevac unit. Um, I ended up going to Kosovo while I was there. You went to Kosovo? I went to Kosovo for three months. What year was that? 2002. Okay. When it was already established, pretty much. Yeah, I was, well, I was out there in 02. Yeah, I went to uh, Camp Bond still. Yeah. I was only going for three months because we're supposed to PCS very soon. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to PCS in November, but that's when my daughter was born. So we stayed there till January of 2003. Mm. And we got Fort Campbell again since we still have, we had bought a house in Fort Campbell, so we wanted to go back. While we were there, of course, the Iraq, everybody got alerted for Iraq. They left. Uh, we were there just long enough to get our household goods there and set up house. And um, she left in April. Uh, 2003? Yes, okay. to Iraq. Yeah. And I left in May of 2003. Okay. We were put in the same company. Mm. <laughs> I had a friend in that, in that company, and he was able to put both of us in the same company. But since she was an electrician, aircraft electrician, and I'm a black op mechanic, she would be in a total different platoon than I would be. Mm. So we weren't in the same platoon, so I, I couldn't be in charge of her nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they sent you to, you know, knowing, knowing that you're, you know, married, both to a combat environment? Yes. Is that, is that pretty typical, especially when you have kids? Uh, yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. While while you're in the military, if you do military, they you have to have the family care plan. Yeah. In case both of you have to be deployed at the same time. Wow. And, and what does the family care plan do? It it it's a you got to have a allotment form, pre pre a pre allotment form. So if you go, you you send you know they can you support your child, whoever. It's, you got to have uh, the person. Uh, Willing to take care of your children while you're gone, and mm. you got to have all this paperwork done mm. prior. While you're in the military, the mm-hmm. whole time you're in the military, this paperwork has to be in our pack office. Mm. So, and then while we were there, my ex got out because her sister couldn't take care of the babies no more. So, she ended up getting out, and uh, I stayed there. Mm. What was uh what was your experience like in in Iraq? And uh, you say you got there May two thousand three, right? Yes. Um, well, every unit kind of different. Um, you know, our day day to day pretty much stayed the you know routine. We worked six days a week. On the weekends, we alternated half the company and the other half, so we get like a day off. And all that, and very hot. Yeah. Iraq. Is there a base that you're on that had been established? We were up in Mosul. There was an airfield there. Um, It was already established when I got there. Mm -hmm. They already had set up tents while I was there. And uh, I saw my first camel spider there. (laughs) How big was that? He wasn't that very big, but when I saw him and I walked toward him, he turned around and I stopped. He turned around to walk away, and I took a few steps. The spider turned around and came toward me. I said, okay. <laughs> I don't need to see you that close, so I went away. <laughs> <On my> way. 
those camel spiders could get pretty big out there, huh? Yes, I, I've seen them about this, about this big, mm -hmm. but I know they get bigger than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was hot during that time, huh? Um, when I got there, yes, it was hot, and it actually did get cold in, in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. We were up in northern Iraq, mm -hmm. and it was November time frame. It was raining a lot where we were walking in mud instead of sand. Wow. And um, I think one night I, when I was on Radio Watch, it had gotten down to 32. It was, but during the day, it would be nice and warm. Yeah. At night, it just freezes. Mm. Do you have any, while you were out there in, in Iraq, do you have any, um, any close encounters uh, with, uh, you know, any enemy combatants or, you know? Oh, we were getting, uh, I remember one, one 4th of July, we woke up to uh, RPGs hitting our compound. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I think one girl got hit with shrapnel in her leg. They hit our, our, our fart fuel lines. Mm. Um, but no, none of the fuel tankers were hit. Um, so what do you do in something like that? You know, you get woken up to... Some you put on your gear and just hope for the <clears throat> best, you know. Mm -hmm. You know that. <clears throat> um, do uh, you guys send anybody out to go to go find out who is launching RPGs at you guys and take care of the threat? I, I don't or? think at that time, but I, I I remember one night we were there and uh, we were having RPGs going over our head. We could hear them, and the, we were, we had we always had two helicopters going out at night, and and. Uh, Check around, make sure they're not, yeah. and they found it was um, being shot off an island by the river, and they found them, and they they shot at the, the RPGs to keep them from firing more and all yeah. that, so they destroyed those. Wow! And uh, RPGs actually hitting our compound. They actually ended up um, killing their own because we had a, a stockade built in our compound with uh, some prisoners and they hit that instead of... Oh, really? Uh, yes. Wow, so they ended up taking out some of their own people. Yes. Wow. Um, what do you do? What do you do with the bodies in that case? I don't know what they do with the bodies. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. It's a, it's an, that's an interesting scenario, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, so how long did you stay out there in Iraq? That first tour was from May through February of uh, 2004. We came back. We uh, went back to Fort Campbell, and we got reflagged to become Third ID. Mm. And uh, we were back in the desert in January 2005 with Third ID, which is Fort Stewart. Yeah. Wow, so that was a nine month, that was a nine month pump, right? Nine month tour. You go home for a little while, and then you're right back out there. Yes. What was the second tour like? It was in Camp Camp Dot Taji. We were at Taji, mm -hmm. Iraq, and uh, that was a rough year for me because me and my second ex were going through a lot of heartaches. Mm. arguing back and forth. So at this point, you're you're now divorced. To the, to the wife that was with you in Iraq the first time? No, I, we weren't divorced. We were just having marital problems. Oh, you were having, okay. So a little bit of... here I'm trying to work, and that time they had us working 12-hour days mm -hmm. with barely a, a, any time off. They put us at night to keep us cool. I preferred the day and be hot. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's uh, it's, it's interesting you say that because... Um, that's that's something we haven't really talked about much during these interviews and stuff is having to deal with you know any types of family issues going on back home while you're in the middle of a combat zone you know trying to right. stay clear headed and focused and trying to keep yourself and everybody around you alive and then having to go you know if some issues are going on back home having that kind of fog up your your brain a little bit what was that like for you well, when I was at work, I tried not to think about what was happening back home and concentrate on, on making sure the aircraft were uh, 
um, able to fly and all that. Mm -hmm. Again, I was a technical inspector. I I uh, signed off the mechanics work, make sure it was up to par by the book and all that. Um, we had another tragic uh, death. We had a young soldier. I don't, he he went ahead and uh, took his life. Oh, while you were out there? While we were out there. Uh, it's fun. It was so strange. He actually went and flew that night. He went on his mission like nothing's going on. He comes back and while they're shutting down the aircraft, he sits by the tire and just took his life to make sure his uh, father was able to get uh, the insurance. That was his reason? Yes. How did you guys determine that? He left a note. Oh, wow. Because uh, he flew with his roommate. They were both crew chiefs. <clears throat> Um, his mom had passed away from cancer prior to us deploying, and his father had uh, cancer too. And mm. since he wasn't, his father wasn't a U.S. citizen and went back to his country. And uh, he had done research where they still pay for suicide under insurance, and he figured that his father could use the money for treatment and all that. Oh, wow. That was the reason, yeah, they found the, the suicide note afterwards. Oh, wow. That's, that's a prime example of what we just talked about, having to deal with family issues back home while, right. you know, you're over. And I mean, this guy was a likable guy. Um, um, I'm not going to say what country he was from and nothing because I want, mm -hmm. you know. No problem. Privacy to the family. Yeah, yeah. No, nope, I understand. That. Um, uh, did you, so you know him? You know him personally? Yes, I knew him. Um, I knew just about all the crew chiefs because I had to work on their aircraft, you know, I had to sign off their work. Mm. So that's the thing about being uh, in a quality control office. You got to have to know everybody. You, you get to learn their uh, the way of working, uh, their shortcuts, and, and you, you're like, you didn't do this right. <laughs> but mm. you, you get to know them and become friends and all that, you know, it's kind of hard when you're out in the desert, you can't just, you, military is a family, you know that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't matter what, what you, where you're from and all that, but when it comes to military, we're all family. I'm still, I'm still a little bit of shock at like the reason for him taking his life. Like, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a noble reason, right? To, to you know, his, his, mm -hmm. his, his dad has cancer and needs money to, try to treat himself and take care of it and uh, ultimately just sounds like he sacrificed his own life you know yes he uh, did for his dad uh, do you know uh, do you know anything about the follow-up story like did, did his no I don't no hmm. I mean there's also you know you think about it, it it's like that's just another thing that his dad has to deal with right now his son's gone Right. Uh, so that, that, that uh, yeah, that's a rough, that's a rough scenario, man. I, I couldn't imagine being in that position. So, um, yeah, sorry you had to deal with that, man. Sorry you lost a friend like that. Uh, um, did you have to ever have to go out? Like, uh, I don't know if you've ever been presented with the scenario, like a, a downed, a downed, uh, you know, what they call them fallen angels, right? Yeah. Well. Uh... I have gone like I'm, but it wasn't for a downed aircraft that was down by uh, crashing. I did have to go recover an aircraft that had a chip light. What's that? Um, when one of the gearboxes are, are tearing apart in, inside, mm -hmm. we have chip detectors in, in the gearboxes, like the main, the tail rotor, the intermediate gearbox. This one had a tail rotor chair box. We went and uh, we're like, Okay, we go with a test pilot. Those are the ones that maintenance test pilot. They're the ones who go recover. We went there, and the guy said this to show us the chips he found. Okay, well, I guess we'll fly it back. We flew it back. Uh, we landed and stopped, and we're like, we noticed something weird about the tail rotor. How it kept going after mm -hmm. we stopped the main rotor blades. Is when you stop the main rotor blade, the tail rotor blade should stop. It went another five, six inches moved. Mm. Um, 
they took the tail rotor apart and found out that the gearbox was ready to rip off. Oh, wow. What, yeah. So what would happen if the gearbox ripped off? And the uh, they and would have to uh, hope they could land that aircraft. Mm. If some, when the, gear, the tail rotor gearbox, the helicopter <clears throat> would just spin, the whole thing would be spinning. Oh, that's ugly. Yeah. Wow. You know how you see in movies, the helicopter starts yeah. coming in like this? That's what would happen. Yeah. I can imagine being in that scenario. And trying to keep that level as you're going down would be very hard. Yeah. Um, so when did you get back from Iraq, uh, the third, or your third tour in Iraq? When uh, did you get back? Uh, January 2006. January 2006? Yes. And uh, at this point, how long have you been in the Army? 18. 18 years. Uh, so you still had a few years left, is yes. that right? What, what did you do for the remaining years? Um, we came back. Um, half of us stayed up at Fort Campbell because we still had children in the in, in school. Mm -hmm. So they let us remain there while the other half came to uh, Hunter Army Airfield. And sold my house while we were there. We didn't, we didn't have much to do. We just had four helicopters to work on mm -hmm. while everybody else was down here. And uh, once we came down here, uh, we bought a house up in here in Savannah. And we did our daily you know, routine mm -hmm. training, whatever training was done. Or we worked on the helicopters and all that. And we got uh, alerted again to go to the desert in May of 2007. Wow. And when you slotted to, to, to retire out? Well, I was in the desert. Oh, wow. So, so then you end up going back for a fourth? Yes, for 15 months. For a fourth tour? Yeah. For 15 months? It was a 15-month tour. It seems like the deployments just keep getting longer and longer, huh? Yes, they, they decided to do that, but I think they went back down to... I think they brought them down to nine months, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so what was that fourth one like for you? Um, everything was going well until uh, six months into it. My ex goes, I want a divorce. I'm like, what? Mm. <laughs> I thought everything was, we worked out all our problems. She said, nope, I was lying to myself. I'm like, okay. But this time I did not let it bother me. I said, well, you know, if she wants it, she wants it. I'm not going to. I did my job. Uh, it wasn't that bad of a tour, you know. We did the. I was in Baghdad at that time. Don't mm. down in like that we had to take a bus to the airfield, where the other two times the airfield was right there. Mm. So now you had to travel back and forth. Yeah, we had to get up earlier. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's like your sleep bus. time. Yeah. Again, 12-hour days, but we worked it where we didn't work more than 14 days, and then we got a day off. Yeah. Um, Do you see anything like you saw on the first couple of tours? Uh, any incidents like that occur while you are out there for that 15 months? We were, actually, our unit, our battalion did pretty good. We didn't lose anybody. That's awesome. Yeah, but we did have your usual, um, there was a suicide there. From another unit, mm. marital problems. That's what we, we heard through Great Man. Not for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, worker found them in the one of the porta potties. He decided to take his life in there. So. Uh, that's horrible. It's always horrible to hear those stories. It is. Oh no. As for us, I think we only sent a couple guys back because they were having issues. Yeah. So was back it, home, and that was it. But mm. so was that your last tour? That was my last tour while we were there. I went ahead and put in, put on our paperwork for retirement. I came back to get to retire from the military and divorce. Wow. So uh, got retired, and while I was retiring, ended up getting divorced. <clears throat> The ex moved. She didn't stay in the house. I said, well, damn, I, that's good for me. I got a house I can stay in. Yeah, yeah. What was it like transitioning back into civilian life for you? I think the hardest thing was uh, 
learning people's first names. <laughs> oh, that's right, huh? I was like, damn. I kept hearing people's first names. I'm like, this is strange. <laughs> it is strange to hear people's first names. I think that was the hardest. Yeah. Um, did you did you work right away? What, what line of work did you uh, do? Actually, I, uh, I went through my whole... I did was applying, but wasn't getting hired. And I finally did get hired on Hunter. Um, they had changed contractors, and it was with a new company, CSC. And I got hired as a technical inspector. Nice. And uh, so I mean, my ex was working there too, so. Yeah. But I needed the money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, you ever, did you ever miss the military at any point? I did. I did. I, 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 one of the biggest things was uh, helping the young soldiers. You know, if they don't understand something, I, I did kind of like trying to teach them. This is what you do, this is how you do it. Um, we did sometimes deviate from the book, saying because, saying this is just going to do this and it's still within reg, so we'd help them out. Hmm. Yeah, it's always, it's always, uh, uh, it, feels, it feels good to pass on your skill sets to the younger generation, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of a lot, I, I hear from a lot of veterans uh, as well. You know, they they missed the camaraderie. You know that they built up while all in the military, um, and it's, and it's hard to find. You know, uh, when transitioning back into civilian life, how how is that for you? Have you have you ever found that? Um, well, when I started working, the good thing was I was still around the Black Hawk. Mm. Uh, there was a few people there that was with me in the military. So it's still good to see a few guys that I've worked with during the past, you know, in the military and all that. Mm -hmm. And and you, since most of us are military, we have that commodity in the in the workforce too. Yeah. Mm. Um. You know, I'm, uh, are you enrolled in the VA at all, Humberto? I am. Oh yeah, you go to the VA. I do. Have you ever thought about, uh, you know, being checked out, or you know, maybe talking to a counselor or something about, you know, you, you, I know it's. Uh, I, I understand it's common. Like, you know, lots of veterans don't want right. to talk about it. You know, they just they just want to put it off. But you know, um, uh, and I'm saying this because I deal with the same thing, right? PTSD and all that stuff. And and uh, you know, I found it helpful to sometimes go talk to a therapist and. Even though sometimes you're just like, we got that attitude, like, I don't want to fucking go talk to nobody about this. You know? It's funny because my primary doctor asked me, you want to go see them? You just, she gave me the number to call, and I never did. Yeah. 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 Maybe she sees something I don't, but yeah. yeah. I know my younger brother suffered PTSD. Yeah. Well, I mean. Because uh, in, in Desert Storm, he, he was more out there in the front than I was. Yeah. Well, and he saw some crazy stuff. Right. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I figure after being what? What was it? Twenty-two years in the army. Twenty for me. Twenty for you. Twenty years in the army. Um, you know, imagine the feelings and everything that you have. It just feels normal for you, right? It just feels like mm -hmm. you know, this is how I'm supposed to. This is just, this is just how a soldier feels, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know, if you're reliving the moments, you know, and and it's it's affecting you in any way, um, then you know, I, I wouldn't be afraid to go talk to someone just see what they have to say you never know right true um hey thanks for being here Humberto. It's no a, problem this is a um it's a big contribution for you to be here and take the seat and tell your story like this for our for our organization urban valor so we just want to say that uh you know thank you from the bottom of our, heart, our hearts and thank you for your service um, you're welcome <laughs>